Hi, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. I don't know. Um, I can't hear you on your end. Or if you've passed the baton to me. I hear a faint little whisper. Uh, maybe you could use the chat if you can um, speak. No, I can't hear uh, you, Brian, either. Odd, I seem to be sealed off into my own little container. Um, <laughs> oh, I can see you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. All right. Great. <laughs> okay. You could hear me? Hi, Lisa. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Okay. Okay. Hello? Kelly, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, Kelly, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Loud and clear. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, please let's let's get seated. Um, we want to start the afternoon section. Um, Yes, uh, we sincerely apologize uh, for starting the afternoon session a bit late. Uh, it, it is not actually what we had um, a plan to do. Uh, maybe we got uh, the opening ceremony wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it didn't start the time it was actually prepared to start. Please accept uh, our sincere apologies. I know if uh, Tunde were to be here too, he would definitely do the same. Brian was with us yesterday. Uh, I, I know that the, the, the participants are actually going to enjoy the session of today. Uh, please, we want to please just get seated as we start. This afternoon section, uh, this is workshop stream four. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the, uh, we are coming from different countries of Africa. Unfortunately, we came with different uh, orientations. And so, the, this is workshop stream for metadata for digital humanities tools and management techniques. Uh, the facilitator that is going to talk, in, talk to us this hour is from University of Kansas, Univers United States of America, Kaylin Dewa. I want you to listen attentively, write down your questions if you have any, and I'm sure that at the end of the presentation, there will then be a period, a period of, uh, of engagement, a period of conversation, and a period of questions and answers. Join me. And with a round of a clap, even as we welcome the speaker, Kelly, from University of Kansas. Okay. Thank you so much. You can go on. Thank you so much for having me. My name is uh, Kaylin Dwyer. So I'm from the Institute for Digital Research and Humanities. Um, and I'll cover kind of 
what metadata is, this is going to be a very broad introduction. So I'm hoping that it will be helpful to all of you in general and some of its uses in, meta in digital humanities, but also just kind of information management and then kind of walk through just kind of the basics of creating a single metadata record, because I hope that that will be helpful and some of the pitfalls and challenges of that. So let me try to figure out how to share my screen here. All right. Seems like I've got that covered. Hopefully you're seeing the correct screen. Right. You're seeing my slides, right? I would assume as much. Looks like it. All right. So one of the most common uh, definitions, which is not totally my favorite, but it's almost ubiquitous, is data about data. And you know, even if you've never heard of the term metadata, I, I'm gonna say that you actually create and use metadata every day. And metadata provides a summary of basic information about data in order to make that data easier to find and work with. I like this definition by Anne Gilliland in Introduction to Metadata, who says that it's the sum total of what one can say at any given moment about an information object at any level of aggregation. So an information object, she's just kind of like abstracting what it is that, that we're describing. So to make that a little bit uh, more concrete, so look at this picture of a robin, which has just a little bit of metadata. And to think about it in aggregate, that would be if we had a lot of pictures of birds and we would be describing uh, the whole collection. But this one single file has a file name and a creator, Stuart DeWire, my husband, and a date and an application, which is the uh, camera that we shot it with, and a format, the file format, which is a JPEG, and then even a geolocation, which is a map. So one of these things that these other metadata definitions are leaving out that I, I don't like is that metadata is kind of more than just a description of an object, at least in the sense that we're defining it. It's If you look at this, there's kind of a structure to it. The metadata has these chunked distinct units, so it can be manipulated at each level. Like when you're looking for files in your computer, you can kind of sort and filter things by alphabetically by name or by the last date accessed or by the date it was created. You know, that's good metadata practice. So you can find things by multiple different terms, it has that sort of structure to it. So I really like this um, structure created by Ann Gilliland. So I'm gonna use it which is the features of an information object for which we want to create metadata. So we want to describe the content and the context and the structure of any object that we have. So the content relates to what the object contains or is about, and the context relates to the who, what, why, and where, and the aspects of its creation and subsequent life cycle. And then the structure relates to kind of, so say you have a whole collection of items, kind of the relations within that collection. And so when we're looking at the functions of metadata, I think I'll just start by sort of sharing this. Um, nope, that's not what I wanted. Portable antiquities scheme. So if you look at this item, this is just like this antique coin, and it it's basically, what am I even looking at here? Um, I guess you can tell that it's a coin, and because of the way that the image is taken, you can tell the size of it. But virtually nothing else, You you what, are, what am I looking at here? But if you look in this Portable Antiquities database, they've managed to say quite a lot about this item. So they've given it a unique identifier. This only describes this coin. It has a full description of its diameter, its thickness, its weight. It's been described as the Roman period. And then they've said that it's it's a copper coin and it's located precisely here is where they found it. So if you wanna find other copper coins and you wanna find them with the same weight or the same currency, now because people have taken all of this labor 
to describe this item, you can find these things that are extraordinarily obscure. And so that is what uh, the content of the item and the context, it's uh, issues of creation access. And now we can actually search for items and we can access them out of the database. And then we can use this database also to discover new things and learn more about them rather than just looking at sort of useless pictures of coins. So that's kind of the list there that I've started describing was the functions of metadata, which is many of these things intersect. You have access, which is that search and that discovery and retrieval, context, that descriptive information that makes sort of a weird copper coin make some kind of sense, and documentation of ownership and authenticity and preservation and interoperability. So documentation of ownership and authenticity is often used for copyright. So if you're trying to make, say, a digital collection, uh, a lot of times you want to know if you are within your rights to put up a digital archive, so a uh, dig digitized image. So you find yourself following this rabbit trail of uh, provenance, who owns the copyright for this pamphlet published in 1936, and following all the acquisitions of the publishers. And if it were well cataloged in a metadata record, you wouldn't find yourself having to go through this winding trail of who owns the item now. Um, but that is proper documentation of the item. And then that's how it helps you use it and access it later. Preservation metadata is often more related to technical things. It's often like with um, video games, for instance, there's the game like Duck Hunt, where you need to have an old CRT TV and a specific video game controller and certain software and hardware requirements all have to come together for you to be able to experience the video game in its original quality. And our digital humanities uh, platforms, the things that we create, we're also having a ton of dependencies. What codes are we putting together? What platforms? And what whole list of things are we going to need to have in the future 10, 20 years from now, when none of those things exist anymore, in order to view your project once again, as it once existed? And the interoperability, the thing I just like to do best is just to pull up a Google search. So I've just... I just pulled up uh, Donald Glover, if it will load because of bandwidth. Um, and so the thing here, interesting, is sometimes you don't really think about the internet because it's just kind of, it just works, right? You don't have to worry about it. But on the side here, you have social media. You have a little bit of a bio about him pulled in from Wikipedia. Movies and TV pulled in from the internet movie database and then um, some Twitter here, and then news articles as well. And all of that is happening because of shared metadata schemas. It's uh, actually schema.org is what's used for things on the web. So the people who are entering in the Wikipedia articles, the people who are putting in movie titles on IMDb, and the people who are writing the newspaper articles, they're all using a shared standard, and that's what makes these results pop up with relevant information. And so I think it's easy to make the case why you should use proper metadata because you want things like that neat search results to show up in your project and be able to find and use things. So for metadata in the digital humanities, I'm gonna give you a few examples of projects that are currently using it, but it feels like almost any project that you look at can say, well, this is metadata too. So a digital archive, many DH projects are archiving projects. So I'll look at the Boston Marathon. Uh, in 2013, there was sort of a bombing in the Boston Marathon, and a bunch of these temporary memorials sprung up. So what this digital archive did was take individual items from the memorials, digitize them, and then put them into the archive. And so they've been able to preserve what was then ephemeral. So you've kind of had this long list here of all of these things that they've managed to describe and contextualize. Uh, they've created a formal title for the object, said that it's in English and a date. It said the genre is posters. So they have some other genres in their collection, like if somebody's left flowers or they've left a teddy bear. This might have like an, a physical object instead of a poster. 
And uh, they have some information on the digital thing as well, that this is a reformatted digital. So that's the technical metadata too. And then kind of scholarly editions is another area. This isn't really, so the William Blake archive is not just an archive, but they're making digital scholarly editions. So they have kind of a full text of these, they're transcribing and then making a commentary on the texts of William Blake. And there's two different editions here with a lot of your scholarly editions and your archives too. But you have the physical original, the thing by William Blake that sits in an archive somewhere. And then you have your digital facsimile that is on this archive right here in front of us. And so both of those things need metadata. The thing that you're probably mainly interested in as a historian is that physical original. So that is the information that they put first, the copy information. And they have all of this detail here. And it seems like it's their own structure. Um, the, the provenance information, um, they have the place of publication. And then they have the electronic edition information as well, which is kind of also who has uploaded this image and when has it been uploaded and who has been involved in the creation of this digital artifact. And a lot of times people won't put that information there. They will put um, maybe just, they'll kind of mix it together or they'll put one or the other. Maybe it will just be the digital information because, oh, well, I uploaded it on this date. And then kind of the physical, the original object information just disappears. And it's just kind of interesting. It's always one or the other or no metadata. Interesting things happen with metadata. I'd also like to look at um, mapping paintings. Oops. Um, so mapping paintings is a problem. Bandwidth issues here again. Bear with me. Is a project where they're actually combining the provenance metadata with um, art and uh, temporal data and geolocation. So they're taking, say, um, any sort of painting and given a time period who owned it and mapping that location so that you kind of wind up with this sort of story of its uh, ownership and place. You get this actual physical map because sometimes these like the ownership can be kind of contentious or uh, lots of theft or um, maybe lots of exhibits or moving through wartime. Um, Europa, this painting, I think it exists in the States now, but sometimes these also have different branches as people like say that we own a copy and then the other people claim that they own the copy. Um, so this is a work in progress and I don't know how far they see themselves going with this, but I find this to be a very interesting exploration of metadata and visualized. So there's just a few ways that metadata shows up in our DH projects. So as digital archives, as digital editions, and then in building up towards data visualizations, both as preservation data uh, for finding things and then also for tracking provenance. So metadata isn't new. And so for as long as we've organized information, we've been creating metadata, documenting and describing and classifying things. But it's the way that we've been interacting with metadata that's changed. And it's becoming increasingly digital and a central part of designing our information systems. So metadata doesn't have to be digital though. So the card catalog is a really good example and I'll start there. So each index card represents one object, like that it's modular. So prior to the card catalog, you just have like a list of things, a shelf list. But with the card, you can easily manipulate it. You can add or remove records. You can rearrange them. You can search the catalog and pull records out. And you can even compare multiple ones in front of you if you so desired. And the cards have one single agreed upon system for documenting information about the object. It's not even labeled because it's kind of uh, agreed upon and determined. You have the title, you have the author, you have the call number, and it has these standards. But the modern approach to metadata is a database. So in a data set, it's like a spreadsheet. So 
So imagine each row is a record for a single object and each column is a single characteristic of those objects. So if we take that card catalog and we just extend it, it just becomes title and author and date and subject. And this is essentially how your library catalog works. And almost any time you're going to be working with metadata and a digital project or a data set, you're going to wind up with something that looks like this. But I just want to take a quick look at something that's happening at the back end of metadata. It's called XML, Extensible Markup Language. It's a set of rules and encoding for encoding documents in a format that is readable by both humans and computers. So many DH projects were using kind of an existing platform. So there's an interface between us and this. So we don't have to ever look at this a lot of the time, unless you're like a librarian or you're really getting into the technical issues of the text encoding initiative or something. But this is what's going on to help make things computer readable and searchable. Um, you have the tag element here DC title, the DC says, this is kind of Dublin core, this is a metadata schema. And then this is the part in between the tags that shows up on the screen in front of us. But kind of, it expands here so that we can see a full record. Um, you get kind of your creator and your title and your description. And this is kind of just how it looks in full. Just, I just wanted you to see how it chunks up uh, in order to make things computer readable and searchable in each of these things. Kind of imagine them as sort of the um, spreadsheet, but different. <laughs> this is how it's working at the back end. So metadata standards are key for interoperability. Metadata, like the card catalog, are really only functional because of these agreed upon standards. So each record in the catalog represents an item and those certain things that we uh, agreed to, and they will be described in this order. And a metadata schema is a label and tagging or coding system used for recording, cataloging information or structuring descriptive records. So a metadata schema establishes and defines data elements and the rules governing the use of data elements to describe resources. So there are many different schemas. And I like to kind of think of them as the way we uh, cite in our bibliographies. So we agree often to like APA or MLA or Chicago. So we're agreeing to a set of rules. And so here's some of the common schemas used in digital humanities projects. There's a lot of them, but here's some of the common ones. It's Dublin Core because it's very, very flexible and basic and then categories for the descriptive works of art, for the description of works of art, because it has some specific terms for cultural heritage objects and art. And then the Visual Research Resource Association, uh, which is designed for visual resources like art and photography, and even has stuff for performances. Um, and within that kind of considering like metadata standards and structure, another part is the concept of having controlled vocabularies. There are standardized words and phrases used to index content for consistent and accurate metadata. So these can include like lists of terms and subject headings and uh, something called an authority file, which tells you exactly how something will be described, what final word to use and to SORI. So a controlled vocabulary is helpful to establish your consistency across a project. So say when somebody searches for a term, they want like, and you might have multiple terms that describe one thing. So you're searching for mobile phone, you probably also want something that's cell phone and maybe you even want smartphone, though that might not generally be true. Um, sometimes you also have one term that describes multiple things, like many people who share the same name. So you need ways to kind of uh, tease out these differences and help people find what they really need. But as soon as we start talking about, I think those that linguistic control 
of controlled vocabularies, we, it immediately presents some critical problems. By whom and for whom is this language, I think. It universalizes the language that we use. I mean, in one sense, the controlled vocabularies are needed to help us find things. But in the other sense, there's a lot of drawbacks and a lot at stake. So as much as metadata has the ability to make items visible and accessible, it also has the ability to hide and suppress by failing to recognize the diversity within its collections and the users of those collections. So in the US, one of our primary metadata standards is the Library of Congress subject headings that they define resources by topic and just classifying these, these big groups. Um, but it, it, in its attempt to classify and generalize, it, it really fails when it comes to social groups that lack social and political power. So there's this critical cataloging movement that's attempted to address these issues in metadata. And one specific issue that they've started with is the term illegal aliens, which is how the Library of Congress subject headings has said things will be defined as that. But they've said, that's not appropriate. We don't want to use that term anymore. And instead, we will use undocumented immigrants. But with the thousands of historical records, the process of untangling the racist history of our metadata standards is very challenging and costly in terms of time and money. So some have gone back and they've manually edited things. Others have managed to batch process. But what is also recommended instead, just to create a visual view. So when you're looking at an item, it says undocumented immigrants, but at the back, the core data holds back and still says illegal alien. And so then the user, they search for maybe that outdated term and the item still pops up, but it only views, it's only visible to the, to the reader as undocumented immigrant. Another issue we face is a lack of terms to describe people or groups. And we attempt to apply labels that are too general and inappropriate for them. So one project is called the Homosaurus created, uh, they've created a vocabulary for LGBTQ groups as a companion to the Library of Congress subject headings in order to extend it with more granular description for their group. And so I think that what we can do with our digital projects is we can identify harmful and biased histories embedded in the metadata of our libraries and archives. And in creating our digital projects, we are empowered to give new language instead of reproducing the harm. So we don't have to use the existing vocabularies in a prescriptive way, but we can use them as a point to build on and a model for our own vocabulary if we want to create a new one, or we can just start from scratch. So the current metadata vocabularies and standards are a great starting point, but they should not be used to control us and define us because we should actually be critical of them and their histories. So I'm going to go back to Dublin Core, which I said was very commonly used because it's uh, kind of simple and flexible. There's always this balance to metadata, which is its ease of use compared with its completeness. Some are very complete, but not easy to use, and some are very easy to use while not being complete. The Dublin Core is a really good balance of the two, and that's why it's used so frequently. So if you kind of use a lot of the um, basic open source digital humanities platforms out there, they by default use Dublin Core. So in its simplicity though, sometimes I find people struggling a little bit with Dublin Core. I think of metadata as a creative act. So even though it has all these like rules and every single one that you encounter has the specific uh, definition and a comment for how to use it, you will make many of your own critical choices along the way. And so these are like the 15 core terms of Dublin Core. And there are many more terms to the Dublin Core metadata set that you could use beyond these. And people don't completely fill out any sort of metadata record. You don't have to. It's an obligation to fill out all 15. You're not obligated to do anything, <laughs> but fill out to the level of completion 
you need to describe your resource. So I guess what I wanted to do, this feels a little bit dry, but because people struggle so much with their first few Dublin Core records, I thought maybe I would just kind of walk through some of that uh, weird flexibility, slippery aspects of Dublin Core, just for like a practical understanding of, well, how do I actually make a metadata record so that when you go off and you start to create your digital archives, that you kind of have a starting place and you've thought through a few of these things, in addition to thinking through having vocabularies and uh, controlled schemas. So title, for instance, um, is a name given to a resource, obviously, right? But typically a title is a formal, uh, the name formally given to a resource. So something I often see is when people are creating a digital archive, they're really focused on like uploading the content and making it accessible. And then they'll just kind of rename things as they wish when they upload it. But you want to be able to find, say, that archival pamphlet as it existed in the real archive. The, so if, you, if you're digitizing some photograph, you want to find the photograph maybe in whatever archive that it existed in, in its box. And so you should give it the real formal title that it originally had in that box. And instead of calling it like image two or JPEG, if it doesn't have a title and you don't feel like you can name it one, then you should create a standard for your project, like such as the author name and date. Here's this other slippery thing, which is creator and contributor. So the creator is who is primarily responsible for making this, and the contributor is, well, somebody who makes contributions, right? But, you know, there's a lot of people involved with creating things, and that includes both the digital and the physical object. So your creator might be the author of a work, and you could include contributors, which is like somebody who wrote a foreword and a preface, and somebody who did the illustrations in a work, and Dublin Core doesn't have a lot of spe specifics like that. Um, the CDWA model, that other schema, the descriptions for works of art, it does have stuff like Illustrator. But Dublin Core is so flexible, it doesn't. So if you have an illustrated book, you might put the creator as the author and the illustrator as a contributor, stuff like that. Or um, with a digital record, perhaps the creator is the one who made the book and a contributor is a person who is the digital contributor of the item who has added it to your digital archive. And coverage versus date is really irritating. <laughs> so date, uh, coverage says it's a spatial or temporal topic of the resource, the spatial applicability of the resource or the jurisdiction um, under which the resource is relevant. So it could be place or location, it could be name or geographic coordinates, it could be period or date range. So why would you ever use this if you already have date? Um, well, it says a uh, period or date range. So when I have a specific date, like today is May 11th, 2021, I use date. But when it's something like fluid, like 19th century or 1967 to 1972, I use coverage. But then it's just weird that coverage can be spatial or temporal. So you can also say a place in just name or place in terms of more specific coordinates. Coverage is weird. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. And that's why people kind of get really confused on it. And then another one I don't like, I'm, I'm saying format and type are two difficult things in Dublin Core. It's easy once you know it. And so format is usually the file format or physical medium or dimensions. So maybe you have some microfilm reels. You're gonna say that it's in microfilm and you're gonna say, this is how long the reel is. Or this is a painting and it's oil on wood. Or this is a JPEG. You have to interpret it as you will, right? But it involves just some sitting back at the beginning of your project and planning how will what what metadata elements will I use and how will I use them?
and what kind of vocabulary will I develop myself as a pro at a project level, or what vocabularies will I use? And then type, as I said, is a little bit like format, which says it's the genre of the resource. And they recommend to use a controlled vocabulary. Like Dublin Core says to use collection or event, image or physical object or sound or text. But I've seen other people kind of use type more flexibly. So there was a digital archive on architecture where they found or they determined a list of types of buildings, and then that became their type. So when you're looking at a specific image, you had a specific type of building listed underneath, and then that helped people navigate the archive better. So again, it all depends. Think about your metadata as creating an information architecture for which to navigate your site and find information and discover it. And then the other slippery one is source and identifier. And this is the last one I'm gonna cover before I bore you out of your minds. But identifier is just kind of this unambiguous reference to a resource. That's a great description, isn't it? Um, what, it what that is, is your persistent links or your DOIs. It's something that's never going to change about an object. Like a call number can change, but no, there's, there's things like identifiers that will never change about an object. And then you will always be able to find an object again, as long as it has that identifier. But source is pretty fluid. And I find myself repeating the term source several times, sometimes when I put an item into a digital archive. So it's where it is derived from. So if I'm making a digital edition, the digital object is derived from a physical object that is located somewhere for real. So the physical object is a shelf mark location. I could also say maybe an acknowledgement statement there, like courtesy of the rare books and library um, at, I don't know, rare book and manuscript library at the University of Illinois. And I could also put a citation there, like a citation format, or if you had done, used a bunch of sources to describe the object, you could put your citations there. And you could use all three of those different forms and different individual repeating the source field over and over. And I guess that's where doubling course flexibility is sometimes helpful for you. But again, I think with each of these things, you can see how it can also be a little bit of a challenge or a little bit confusing. But once you get it, uh, I think it's a really valuable tool for your digital projects. I myself really like Dublin Core, and then I like to extend Dublin Core for um, when you're creating a really specific project, kind of adding your own terms is needed from that sort of basic set. So I guess kind of I'll wrap up here and then we'll have time for questions. But metadata for DH, it's kind of the focus here is just making your projects accessible making them discoverable, huh? letting people being able to find the items that you've put into your project and providing that context and description so that things are meaningful and documenting the provenance and authenticity of what you've put there and then preserving that work that you're doing so that it actually lasts and means something. So I guess I'll wrap it up there and um, take your questions. should you have any. And I hope that metadata is not entirely boring because I know it can be a little bit dry if you are not deep into the library world of metadata. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much. Kellen, thank you for the presentation. I metadata it's actually a very important aspect of uh, aspect of uh, uh, digital humanities scholarship, and so and so it is 
um, uh, very important that the lecture, I'm sure that we're going to have um, a PowerPoint uh, uh, sent to us. I'm sure that uh, you are going to send a PowerPoint to us and uh, the participant will definitely uh, go back. Then we, we take some few questions uh, before we, uh, we she steps aside. Yeah, so if you have a question, one, two, Yes, normally I will tell you that the, there is no afterthought um, uh, of questions. Uh, just a piece of information. The uh, participant from uh, Togo, uh, uh, Ivory Coast, and other places, please, the post, uh, the COVID uh, reply you got, please send it to, I have forwarded an email to you, send it to that email so that we process uh, your return. Thank you so much. Okay, the first question. Okay, please make it brief. It's not a narrative. Neither is it a thesis. Uh, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's very informative. Uh, as it said, I'll go straight forward to the question. Um, can you, uh, my name is Kuma from Togo, University of Lomi. Okay. Uh, I've listed three questions, but if I uh, can be allowed to ask them all. And the first one is, uh, what are the characteristics of uh, uh, mirror data? Because uh, when I've been dealing with this, I found five. But can you, uh, can I? Okay, now, can you come back to the characteristics of uh, uh, mirror data for us? The second question is, what is uh, uh, internet of things? When we talk of metadata, uh, they always refer to Internet of Things. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let me stop this question. It's all right. Yeah. Yes. I have to pay. Okay. Well, now the third question is uh, uh, about. When we, have, when we talk of the five characteristics, we list, the last one is value. And my question is, what is exactly value when we talk of metadata? We are looking for knowledge in metadata. And um, the knowledge will be used to in projects, for example. And that knowledge must be uh, valuable. Now, how do you um, access value in metadata? That is because uh, I'm waiting for the answer because I have another. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, maybe I will try to take them one by one. I guess I will possibly share my screen again to go back to the characteristics. I'm sorry that there were kind of a lot that I threw at you there. Um, and I will try to share this presentation with you um, afterward, but I can get a PDF of this. So kind of these functions that I was talking about is this, is this what you meant, these five functions, the characteristics? Is it, that's what I think. Um, when I heard um, five characteristics, I was thinking of these five different functions of metadata, which is that you can access uh, items with metadata. So we can uh, search for items and retrieve them. So if I'm looking into a database for, um, coins database, and I would like to find all of the copper coins, then because somebody has taken the care to describe this, 
then I can find everything that is copper, or I can find everything from the specific Roman period or with the specific stamp mark on it. And I can search for that and then retrieve it. And then with discoverability, that also means that this isn't a useless collection of photos of copper and bronze coins. It actually is a place where I cover information. And I think, you know, you said that, that information have value. Um, well, I think that determines, that's more of a collection development thing is, um, and, and are the items in my collection of value, are they worth describing? Are they worth keeping? Um, possibly, but you wanna describe specifically the information as it needs to be described in order for it to be found. But there's a lot of different parts of metadata. And so not all of these functions of metadata are relevant to all projects. So you aren't necessarily a technical metadata specialist. You're not necessarily a preservation archivist, right, with your digital project. And so you might not need to include all of the technical metadata, like you are archiving a photograph. If you're a technical metadata specialist or you're um, preserving things at the library level, you might actually want to know everything about the camera that took the image and the time that it was taken on that camera and all of the edit history. But if you're creating a digital archive to tell a story about these images, you probably don't need all of that information because your goal for the project is not necessarily preserving those digital items. Leave that to the archivist, right? Keep the metadata to the needs that you have. Like, think about how people will access your project. Think about what they're trying to discover and retrieve, and then tailor your metadata to those needs. And that's, I think, what I consider to uh, be the value of the metadata that you're creating is what is its value to the users that you are, that your project is seeking to uh, serve, right? So for the context, um, I discussed the descriptive information. Uh, you see this kind of the rich contextual metadata, it comes out a lot with um, archival descriptions, like with uh, manuscripts and rare books. Those, those were very verbose descriptions, whereas there might not be as much to say about the coin that I picked out. And many things may have just one or two lines to say, but when you look at it, it's just kind of your free text description. What has the researcher, sort of an archivist as researcher, what can you determine about the object? Maybe it's a physical description kind of describing to us as if we aren't looking at it in front of us. So say we, say we didn't have a screen in front of us, say we didn't have the object in front of us. Can you describe it to us? What are we looking at? But then also what is the history of this object and why does it matter? And that is kind of the context of that object. And then that ownership and authenticity is kind of who actually owns this item, the intellectual property, the copyright to it. So that's more in publishing is who has published this item, who owns the rights to it. Or maybe also where does this object reside? There's kind of an issue where lots of libraries will say that they own an object um, they own the copyrights to it because they've digitized it. They don't. <laughs> the author still owns the copyrights to it. But uh, that is kind of an, an issue where I showed you the provenance of the paintings and the mapping provenance. That is metadata. And we only are able to map the provenance of the paintings because somebody has included it in metadata in the object where you kind of go to a museum currently and you look at the bottom of the record, oftentimes it actually has a little section that says provenance and it has lists every single date of the past owners of the object. And so now they're just mapping it. And then, as I said, preservation uh, for helping us access and use objects at a later date, such as like a video game or the projects that we're creating and knowing what kind of technical specifications we need in order to use them. And the interoperability, how much can we communicate between different systems? And I, I don't know what you're meaning by the internet of things. I don't think I use that term, 
But there is a term I know with metadata, which means like citationality in order to link out across broad projects and connect. Um, sorry, sorry. Being able to connect to other projects is something that metadata enables us to do. I liked, I guess showing that Google search was one way that kind of metadata brings things together into that internet of things is that um, all of those different projects like uh, the internet movie database and Wikipedia are using a standard called schema.org. And what they're doing when they do that, it kind of pulls it all together into our Google search um, because they're using those shared terms. And that is kind of our agreed standard for the internet. And the more we agree, the more we use agreed upon systems and terms, the more we're able to achieve some sort of uh, connectivity. Oh, I have an idea for something that also kind of helps maybe before I maybe stop and give a chance for the next question. But the Digital Public Library of America, there's something also called Europeana, and they both sort of function in this similar way off, off of the same sort of model is uh, so you have kind of all of these libraries that are partner institutions and they have, I don't know, I guess we'll look for whatever. Um, I don't know what to look for. My brain has gone blank. But so all of these individual libraries have agreed to follow the same metadata schema and then they upload their metadata to Europeana or the Digital Public Library. And then all of those images are pulled together into one aggregate search engine. So you can be searching across 50 different libraries, digital collections in one single place and get to all of their text and images and uh, sound recordings and all of them in one place, linking us all together. And that's the power, I think, of that standard uh, shared schemas. I don't know if I uh, was helpful with those answers or if there's any other questions. I have lost the room. Okay, yeah, um, the second question, please. Just be very brief. Okay. My, My first, first question. question, in your presentation, you made us to understand certain features of uh, metadata. Now, I want to ask, since any information object uh, can be examined regarding its content, okay. context, yeah. Um, the second question, please. Just be very brief. Okay. Context okay. and ask in the now in the arena of digital humanities, where a disciplines disciplines are located. How 
will controlled vocabularies be applicable to metadata in a discipline like indigenous knowledge management? Yes, yes. Pull something up. You talked to us about certain biases that may yeah. feature in metadata. Uh, Definitely. I'm, I'm sorry. I just got like tempted since I'm at my computer. I got so tempted to just like immediately look up some. I remembered I don't have chat to share it all with you. Um, <laughs> there is actually work, a lot of work going on to create indigenous subject headings um, by several people because this is such a wide issue with biases and subject headings. Um, and they like fail to represent groups. Um, both with uh, harmful language and lack of language, and then kind of with these weird hierarchies. And there's, there's just whole groups that are hidden and suppressed in our library systems. So there's multiple projects um, which I can share at, I guess, via email afterward um, through just, just to give you immediate access to some of the things that are going on rather than just kind of uh, listing them. I think most of these are US based, so I don't know um, how helpful that will be to you. Um, but maybe as a model, and we can also kind of, I can start to look for other projects that may be more relevant internationally. But there are many things going on because we recognize that the language that exists right now is not adequate. And so these are often um, archiving initiatives sometimes run by librarians but oftentimes by groups themselves that work together to determine uh, new terms and so in digital humanities i think controlled vocabularies are um always controlled vocabularies are kind of uh, it doesn't matter whether or not we're working in digital humanities or any other field it's that we're managing information and so controlled vocabularies are going to help us um with kind of making sure that our that our words across our own collection are kind of consistent, kind of like a style guide, I guess, in a most basic sense. So that if you kind of have a bunch of tags, it's like, you know, when you use Twitter, Twitter tags, everybody has to use the same tag if you want to have any hope of finding the people talking about the same topic. So just, just in a very simple sense like that in your DH project, you want to have a defined set of terms to use. And so, um, I'll kind of point out the existing indigenous projects that I know rather than listing them out. And hopefully that will be helpful. Is there time for, I don't know if that makes controlled vocabularies make any more sense, that it's not really a DH specific thing, that it's just kind of in we are organizing information, so it's going to help us to have a consistent um, process for doing that. But then there's there's still a lot of groups out there doing indigenous vocabularies. I don't know if that's helpful. Or if there's time to finish up with um, another question. Any other question? Okay, I think uh, we, yes, in the absence of, um, sorry, Kellen, I don't think there are other questions. Uh, can you see here us? Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, Eve, but I know that your contact is there. Um, uh, have some of them, uh, they, please don't forget to send us the PowerPoint and we're going to share it and I'll be very, very ready to, to please, uh, if in case some of them are actually eager to, 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 to contact you for further engagement and discussions. Thank you so much for, uh, for being with us and sparing your time to, to talk to us. I'm sure that uh, the information you have given us, it will go a long way to build our capacity in DH. And each and every one of them 
received the uh, gratitude from different countries of Africa and that are gathered here even this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you. Yes, a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you so much and bye-bye. Uh, okay, we we proceed to okay. Melissa, are you on? Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear oh, me? Uh, you, yes, your voice is sounding so 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 and she's so forceful. I okay. mean, uh, <laughs> Sorry. yes, it, it's giving us what we are going to actually. Um, we are expecting a lot from you. Lisa, collaborative test analysis and visualization with Python and uh, GIT Git, uh, part one. The, that means that the, the, the paper, uh, the, the workshop is divided into two parts. It's going to take one now, and then by tomorrow, a second one will be taken. So please take note. It is very important, this, for some of you that are interested in visualizations, you have been asking questions on visualizations. You stand opportunity to, to receive from her fresh information. And um, if you have questions, ask the, the, the course of giving, delivering the workshop. Please write down all the information you, all the, the questions you might want to ask. I want to quickly inform us that uh, Lisa Tangliaferi is a director of developer education as source graph, New York City, that's the United States of America. And so she's, uh, this afternoon, uh, has linked to us, is going to deliver, uh, facilitate a session entitled Collaborative Test Analysis and Visualizations with Python and GIT, that is Git part one. Please, a round of applause as she takes the stage. Okay, Lisa, you can go ahead. Sure, thank you. Um, so this is going to be a, a hands-on technical workshop, and I'm not sure if we're going to try to go through the setup. Um, but if you get lost, I'm going to have the I'm going to have tutorials on this um, GitHub repo afterwards. So we'll we'll try to keep you all together. Um, I, if somebody has a question in the middle with technical problems, like please, please feel free to stop me because I can't, I can't see your screens. Um, but what we're, there's two things that we're going to want to install here. Um, let me share. Um, so we're going to want to install two things. One of them is PyCharm and you can go to it's jetbrains.com slash PyCharm, or you could search in Google or your search engine of choice. And you should be able to, you could download, I think, a trial version if that's faster for you, or you could sign up through the .edu um, email address if you have access to that. And the other thing um, that we're going to download is called GitHub Desktop. which you could, um, it should auto populate for your whatever, whether you have Mac or Windows. Um, so while you're downloading, I'll just give like a little bit of an overview of what PyCharm and GitHub are in case you don't know. Uh, so PyCharm is 
it is considered an IDE. Uh, it's just a development environment to help you while you're coding. Um, PyCharm is a common one for Python, but there's lots of different ways that you could code in, in Python. Um, it just makes it, it keeps everything kind of contained. It gives you a virtual programming environment so that your programming files don't get all mixed up. You don't have to worry about the different kinds of Python you have installed. Um, for the work that we're going to be doing today, we're going to be using a version of Python 3. It doesn't matter which version of Python 3 it is, but make sure you're not using Python 2.7 instead. And then GitHub, if you're not familiar with it, is a is a place where people put code to collaborate with each other. Git is a version control system so that you could be working on code alongside your colleagues and you're not going to mess up each other's work. So it just allows you to have different, to be working on your own features separately and then to merge it together without causing any conflicts of code. Um, so we're going to be working in this GitHub repo, which I have here. Um, I'm not sure what the easiest way to share this link with you is, but it's github.com. And then it's my username, which is my first initial L, last name, um, T-A-G-L-I-A-F-E-R-R-I. And then it's um, this lssdh hyphen python hyphen git. How are we? How are we doing? Should I pause a bit? Okay, so basically what we want to do is we want to actually clone this repo so that you could download the files. Um, you should be able to, once you have GitHub Desktop installed, you should be able to open it directly with GitHub Desktop. Um, this is this is where it is on my computer because I have a few things that are on there. Um, but then once you have all of these files here, uh, we're gonna go into PyCharm and work with it. Okay, so what we want to do once we're in our PyCharm environment is to start working with Python right on the command line. So when you have this lssdh um, directory on your computer and you have it installed, then you'll be able to start working with what we call the terminal. Um, and if you if you're getting stuck at all, uh, there is a tutorial to to do this setup here. It's under the tutorials section, and it's Python install and setup. So what we want to do is make sure that we have this um, file, the lssdh Python file, and then we have it loaded in PyCharm. We have a Python 3 interpreter set up and we could start doing some coding in, in Python. Um, can folks see this 
this text okay? Let me see if I can make it bigger. Yes, we can see, we can see that. Okay. So once we have everything set up in, in PyCharm, um, if you don't have PyCharm set up, you could also use a, a terminal window instead. Um, just, just so you know, you could run the same kinds of things in, in a Python terminal window. Um, but we're, I'm going to demonstrate in PyCharm. Um, so the first, the first thing to know is that there's a few ways to work with Python, and one is with the with the Python interpreter. Um, since I know that we have Python three as the interpreter in PyCharm, I'm going to use the command Python to run the Python interpreter, and I know that we're getting a Python three version. If you're getting um, feedback that is Python 2.7, uh, then instead you're going to want to make sure you're choosing Python 3, which we would write um, Python 3 straight like that, with no spaces, and just ensure that that Python 3 point whatever is being used. Uh, so if you've never coded in Python before, a pretty common thing to do is to do the hello world uh, program, which is very popular in every kind of programming language. In Python, it looks like this. It's a print statement with uh, parentheses and hello world in quotation marks. So it doesn't actually matter like what you write in here. Uh, it should display the same. So when we press return or enter, we'll get this feedback of what we have here in the quotation marks. Um, it could also be with just a single quotation mark instead, and we'll get that feedback, whatever we write in there. Uh, so Python and other programming languages are uh, pretty good at math as well. Uh, so if we want to initialize a a variable of x, uh, we want to say that x is equal to 2. Uh, we could declare that in a statement just like that. If we say to print x, this time since it's a variable, we already assigned it the value of 2. Um, we could just call the print function. So print open parentheses, close parentheses, all no spaces closed up with the X in the parentheses, we'll get the feedback of two back when we when we press enter or return and run that program. We could also do um, math within our print statement. So if we wanted to multiply that X by itself, so two times two, we'll get the feedback of four. Uh, if we want to evaluate whether x is equal to x, the equals equals sign uh, being a equivalency test will get uh, the feedback that that is true. Um, in computer science, this is considered a, a Boolean with true-false value. And then uh, we could also test whether x is um, greater than 6. Uh, as we recall, the x we initialized as equal to 2. So x is not greater than 6. So Python tells us that that is false. OK. So, so far, you know, we we looked at this hello world. Uh, we are looking at uh, how Python handles some math equations. Um, now let's have a string value so that hello world is a string value in quotation marks. We'll initialize that with the uh, variable of a book. Uh, we'll put in a book that we like as the book. 
Um, press enter. So now book is equal to La Petite Pule. And then we'll do print book. And we get the feedback of that title is equal to the book. So if we want to um, talk about how many books we have, uh, maybe behind behind us in the video, um, we could put number of books equals 100. Um, we could do the same thing that we were doing before with the with that X and do number of books and do math with it. So if we want to add, like say we just acquired a new book from the library. So we do number of books equals number of books plus one. And then we want to print out how many books we have now. We'll get 101 because we increase that number. Uh, we could also make this go a little quicker by uh, plus equals five. So say we got five more books from the library after that first one, then we uh, can print again. And now we have 106 books total that we, we have taken out from the library. Um, Python is also good with being able to take in user input. So if you're um, if you're working on a program that you want the user to interact with you, um, you could do this with a um, input function. So let's say the username uh, we want it to take in somebody's somebody's name who's interacting with the program. We could have the prompt for that person that user to enter their name. Uh, if we run that, we'll get the feedback, enter your name, and then the user can put in their name. So I'll put in Lisa. Um, and then we can do some work with that name. So now this username that we initialized is equal to this user input. So username plus uh, we'll say what we're reading. Okay, so Lisa is reading. Uh, if we want to add that book that we were talking about before, we could use the same construction. So the plus signs, you know, in math, it would mean addition. When we're working with strings, it'll just put all the strings next to each other. So the username is equal to the Lisa string. We're adding this string ourselves here, and then we want to add that that original book, this book that we initialized. Um, so we could make an entire uh, sentence with this. Um, how are we doing? Uh, so another thing that is good with programming is programming helps you automate things and helps you do things more quickly. So if we want to kind of, um, if we want to kind of start looping through things or have some have Python do something over and over again for us, we could do that with with loops. Um, so this is a this is a for loop, for example. Um, in Python, this um, we use for spaces, but Python will forgive you if you don't use for spaces. Um, so what we're doing here is we're we're creating this range between the numbers zero and five. Um, we're saying for whatever value in that range, print that value. So it's going to move through those five numbers. Um, so here we'll do, we see that it started at zero. It went to one, two, three, and four. So this is the five numbers that it went through um, in programming usually start with zero. Um, and this is going to be important when we start working with text. 
So if we want to talk about that, those library books that we borrowed and, and start like kind of listing them out, we could do that with Python. Um, so we have the Laputu Pool that we had before. We could just add whatever uh, books you're reading right now. Um, you could put whatever books here, um, but here we're creating, we're basically doing something like this. So we're saying all of the books that we take, we took out from the library, here are their titles. They're each the string. We're using a comma to separate them. So this is just like this, our hello world and the string. Uh, we're using square brackets here because this is called a list data type. So it's it's a little bit different, um, but it's, it's basically a set of these books. Uh, so now we have that books variable initialized here. And then we want to do basically this again, but with the books. So for book and books, and it doesn't matter really what you're calling this, it's just going to it's going to move through it. We do the four spaces and then we do print book. And then it will it what happened here is that this for loop took this data and it printed each of them because this is this is all we're telling it to do right now is to print them out so it printed this one it printed this one this one this one this one and it stopped at the end because it took in this this set the book set is the same and then it stopped so if you were able to set this up or or not, um, we're going to move into, oh, we're in the right place, I think. Um, we're just going to make sure that we have access to this text file. So if, if we look here, what we have set up right now, um, we have this, so this is, this is the readme. Um, we have this setup.py, which we'll need to set up if we don't have a setup. Um, but right now we're going to start working with these Python files. Um, there's a text file here. Uh, if you if you have not downloaded all of this yet, what you could do if you could go to this. Um, this initial URL and then navigate into the text. You could download the raw file. Uh, but this is, um, this text uh, came from Project Gutenberg. Um, it's Phyllis Wheatley, who is uh, the first uh, published African-American poet and we're going to just work with this text a little bit. Um, so first, what we wanna do, we'll go back into our Python interpreter with Python. Um, when we're in the Python interpreter, we know because we have those three carrots on the side, um, but what we wanna do is start working with this text. So we're going to create a variable that says, we'll use the word Wheatley for her surname. And we're going to use this open function. Um, in Python, you can open and close text uh, with something called file IO, which stands for input output. Uh, it just allows you to start to navigate around, um, around your file path. So we have this file 
in this text folder. So we're just going to call that text. Oops. So this um, here, we said that the Wheatley that we defined as um, opening up this text, and then we're going to tell Python that we want it read. So when we when we run that, this Wheatley.read, it will show us this entire file, um, which maybe it's not what we not super useful, but we know at least that we were able to set up the Python Python correctly. So we know that we have this file set up, um, and we could we can leave the Python interpreter with Control D, um, and then. In our PyCharm, we should have a programming environment. In this case, it's called Venv. Um, should I, shall I pause a minute? Are we doing, how are we doing? Do we have questions right now? Well, well, we can see what you're doing. Okay. Anybody? People seem confused here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most of the people here don't have their background. This yeah. Their first contact with programming. Yeah, I, I was hoping that um, the tools would be downloaded beforehand, but I didn't uh, know. I didn't know how to communicate that besides the abstract. Um, what, what will help? For Lisa, folks who don't, yeah. Uh, are there videos that you can give us the link so that some of our uh, guys they can watch and then perhaps get better on this? Yeah, yeah. I um, I could. Let's see. Tomorrow we could do this again in like a in a like a Google col collaborative um, environment, if that helps. Um, I can show you kind of where where we're getting, if, if that will help. And then if, if you can, maybe you could add files to this GitHub Hello, repository. Uh, Hello, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to disrupt your presentation. Uh, I would suggest that you continue with it. We have the recording. So we'll go over and over, you know, over the recordings of your presentation. And with time, people get used to it. So you can continue. We are getting you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so what we would, what you would do now is when you have everything set up, is we want to run, we want to run this setup.py file because this has all the requirements for what we're doing, and it's um, you don't need to 
worry about all of what it looks like, but it's basically using these packages. So what's good about Python is that it's pretty, it's, I mean, it's not super duper old, but it's an, it's an older, more mature programming language and it has a lot of packages. So people who have already programmed and figured out some problems, they shipped it together as a package so that you can use these um, tools. Uh, so matplotlib is a tool that helps you helps you plot. It's it's used a lot in in maths and and sciences. NumPy uh, is also used for for data. Um, PyLint checks to make sure that our Python programs are good. Um, Word Cloud is a, a tool that will help us uh, statistically analyze text and visualize the text. And NLTK is a natural language processing toolkit. Um, natural language processing uh, is can be used for linguistic analysis. It could also be used for kind of judging whether a language, like whether words are like positive or negative connotation. Uh, it's used a lot in, in social media as well. Um, like just to see like, you know, if a, if a company wants to know if people are, you know, if they respond well to their brand, then they might use natural language processing to do semantic analysis to see if people are saying positive things about them. Um, so what, once you have all of these things downloaded, you could run the Python uh, setup.py with just like this. So it's, and actually if we have to make sure we're in the right folder, cause I don't think we are. Um, so you wanna make sure you're in this main folder with the setup.py and then you would run python setup.py develop um, i already have everything set up but it might when you're doing this it might take a little while for it all to download um, at this point we could start working with these files uh, so right now we just have this this one text in here theoretically uh, over time, we could collect text and have a corpus of text, and then we could do this work across a bigger corpus. So say you're interested in um, 19th century uh, French literature, you could download a lot of it and start to kind of make analysis across the big corpus. Um, if you're interested like in one author, you could include all of the text that you know you have access to digitally. Um, obviously newer texts might have copyright claims, um, but that's another another story. Um, so there's two uh, files that I have started to set up here which we're gonna work with. Um, so one of them is this uh, frequency distribution file. Uh, so it has these import statements here. So in uh, Python, so those files that I was talking about, those packages, which are in this requirements.txt, uh, just to in in order to use them, we're gonna write these import statements down. So we have import numpy, um, import matplotlib, import nltk. Uh, we're gonna import stop words. Um, stop words are words that we don't want to count. So words that are very common that won't really tell us a lot about the text. So words like the and a uh, and n in English. Um, and then we're going to start to, to build out this program. So we have a, a bucket that's going to collect all of these words. So basically similar to what we were doing earlier, when we 
collected all of those books that we were reading in a in a list we're initializing this the list of all of these words so what we want to do is have python read this file and then put each of these individual words into this this bucket of all words here uh, so using those the way we were um, kind of importing the file and adding and we had python read that whole file to us instead of having it read it and print it to us we wanted to read the file and put each of the words into this um, all words variable bucket um, and then we have this stop words which is those words like the and uh and 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 while we don't we don't want those words to count so we're going to tell python to to not count those words um i don't need to do this right now you could see what those stop words are, for example. Um, rest assured yeah. that this is not as difficult as it, as it appears. Honestly, it's not. So it just takes uh, frequent practice. Yes, I know. Um, I was trying to get to get us going, but um, so basically, what we want to do is initialize this text. So this is similar to what we were doing on the terminal earlier. So we just want to open that text, this, this text here. So we're doing a loop across this text. I mean, if we're, um, we could just run this. So I, instead of typing it all out, I have it um, prepared here. So basically we'll see what it does. So you could get a sense. So what we're doing with this is we are asking Python to detect like the most popular, the most commonly used words in this text. And what does that, what does that tell us about the text? I mean, you know, that's what you use the humanities for, but uh, we just kind of want to see what what are the trends of this text like what is important to this text like some of the things like what we are going to want to do eventually is get rid of some of these like kind of characters and we don't need thou and thine so you would be in this stop words file but uh since it's not an, an older version of english they're not in there but we'll probably what we are kind of interested in is these other words like God, death, soul, skies, eyes. Um, so what what we're doing, I mean, just to kind of talk talk through it. So 
So we have this all words bucket, which takes all of all of these words. It puts it in here. Then we have this stop words list, which is from the, the natural language processing uh, corpus. So they have a, a list of words, which you would be able to inspect in your files when you download it. Um, and what, what we have here is we're going to add those additional stop words. So I don't remember all of them right now, but words like thou and thine, we would put so that those words aren't counted. And then we would have all of these count as stop words. So these official words, the official words that we don't want counted, and then the new words we don't want counted because of this particular text. Then we're opening up the file. Um, we're just saying as the file is open, we are going to have these lines uh, put into here. We're tokenizing each of these words. So it's basically saying that, you know, we want each word discrete without the spaces. And then for each of the, each of those words, we want to make it lowercase so that we count them, right? So if, I mean, she mostly uses um, proper nouns, but for example, like the muses, like we want it to count whether it's uppercase or lowercase so that it's not considered two different words. So we make everything lowercase. Um, then as long as those words are not, we're not putting them in those stop words bucket. Like as long as those are words that are not those frequently used like English words, then we're gonna put it into here. So then what we're doing next is we're creating this um, frequency distribution chart. We don't need this. Um, so we're just going to say what are all of the words here and what are the we're going to have Python count them for us. So the words that are the biggest, the most used words are going to be on the left side of this chart. Uh, we're creating this plot of this frequency distribution plot. Uh, you could, you know, change the size of it with these numbers. Um, but basically that is what we're doing. Um, so some of these kind of extra words we could start editing out. I think it's like a parenthesis, like. Um, so the reason why these like um, typographical characters are showing up is probably because this text is not as clean as it could be because it might be that like some commas are on their own because they sh they usually shouldn't be counted Push. So now, oops. So now with, we didn't get all of them, but with some more of those taken out, we could start to see like what, what actually are the more important words to this text. Um, and then, you know, once we get rid of all of this, then it should, we should see like a better understanding of the trend here. Yeah. 
Yeah, so after this, like we would, this character, we have to find out exactly how to render them in the in code. Um, we would take out the exclamation point, the other quotation mark, um, and then we would probably take out the and shall and ye and are, and then you would have a better understanding of like what's happening in this text. So even though you have never possibly read this text before, you would kind of start to understand some of these themes. Um, and the other thing that I want to show you is this um, word cloud. So it's word clouds, if you're not familiar with it, does kind of the same thing, but it visualizes the, the words of a text in these, in a statistical terms. So the most, the words that are most used will be big. The words that are less commonly used will be small. Uh, so similar to this, uh, you know, the, the word God, I remember we saw skies, heaven, soul. So these are some of the words that um, Phyllis Wheatley is concerned about with her in her poetry. Here we could also get rid of some of those extra like words that we don't, you know, that are not as indicative of what this text means. So we would try to get rid of the thou, the this, the apostrophe, thy, ye. Um, but you kind of have to use your judgment there because you, in some cases, you don't want to delete things away that are kind of useful. Um, so if we add those here, Yeah, so thine is still pretty big, which we'd probably get rid of thine. We'd probably get rid of thus and shall. But then you would see that like the words that are kind of important are, are death, skies, God, day, soul, I. Cool. How are we? How are we doing? Do we, we have... I'll leave time for questions and I'll, what I could do is I could um, add tutorials, to, a little, a few more tutorials to this, um, the GitHub repo to help people along. Cause maybe um, tomorrow we could go through again. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for the presentation. Uh, opinions are divided. Some people, the field is so difficult. Other people are happy. At least they are getting some foundation. Uh, nevertheless, we want to thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm sure that you would like to take some questions. Very few of them. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions. If it also helps, I could show you like what I have done with this, if that gives you more of an idea of how to use this. Okay. Sure, I could. Okay, okay please go ahead, go ahead. I mean, just to give you context so that, <laughs> um, so yeah, this is one of my research pro projects. So this is um, this is a collection of letters, and basically, data visualization can help you see things in in different ways. So uh, this writer, Katharina da Siena, wrote about we have about four hundred of her letters, and how did how do you kind of code that and look at that? How do you see like who she's writing to? Um, and you, some things like this, like what are the words that are important to her? Uh, so just those are kinds of like what I think 
what Python offers and like the statistical analysis offers is allows you to see like bigger trends in text, especially big groups of text. Like um, at MIT, we use Python to study uh, how gender was portrayed in 19th century English language novels. And that's something like you can't read all of those books on your own. And a lot of the books you probably are not interested in, but you could still kind of understand like what's culturally at stake in that by looking at it in this overview. Um, okay. Um, uh, thank you so much. And yes, just you, you have a question. Okay, and then two, we have at least, uh, uh, we can only take two questions. The next speaker is online, so you'll be, uh, the, you'll be very brief. In your... Oh, okay, Lisa, you, uh, I'm sure you, you'll be back tomorrow. Maybe you take the questions tomorrow since. Um... Sure, whatever is, whatever is good. Um, and you could share my my email address also. I'm happy okay. to. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. We we'll share your email address and then uh, you can get those questions even before you you mount the stage tomorrow for your second presentation. Thank you so sure. much. We are very grateful having you. Please. Sure. Thank you. I'll I'll go. I'll try a different way tomorrow. <laughs> Lisa, uh, this is Tunde. Um, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking time off to be able to be with us. Uh, I remember I just uh, posted a request uh, on the on the list uh, asking for ESPA to come and teach on this program, and you graciously accepted to teach. Uh, we really, really appreciate uh, that sacrifice, um, and we hope that tomorrow uh, we'll be able to uh, see you again. And uh, yeah, maybe in a more simplified form. Yes, I'll try some more <laughs> simplified form. <laughs> so we hope that uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. We really appreciate um, uh, sharing your thoughts and uh, your knowledge and experience with us. So we are going to see you tomorrow. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Queen is actually waiting online uh, to handle the next session. So we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you All so right, much. Thank you. Bye for Bye. now. Yeah. Please, a round of applause for our speaker. Hi. Okay. Does, does everyone need a break first? I'm okay. We can wait if, if everyone needs to, to take a breather. Uh, no, no, it's okay. Queen, Queen, uh, no, Queen, it's okay. We, we are going to take you right now. Um, all right. Okay. Um, uh, okay, just a, a moment for... Uh, okay, just a moment for a very brief... Uh, uh, introduction. Uh, yes, I, I yeah, I do. I met Queen in Netherlands for the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I and uh, we have also been actually uh, meeting uh, visually. Uh, I had expected her to be in Lagos, uh, but I, I'm, we are sure that uh, in one of these uh, summer schools, you, you should be here in person. That would be wonderful. Okay. okay. So this we are going to actually listen to tools for test miming and analysis. This is very important for some of us and almost everybody here. And so you have to be very attentive. How do you mime a test? And what are the tools necessary? Some of you have asked questions. As regard, I told you to just hold on that other presenters will be able to do that. Please don't have an undivided attention as we listen to, to Queen. Dombrowski, Standard, um, Stanford University, United States of America. Please, a round of applause. Yes. Okay, you can right. go ahead. Then. Thank you so much. Um, and it's it's great to be here virtually. Um, uh, and thank you for, for um, hanging in there so late for this talk. Um, time zones are, are always a challenge um, with this kind of thing. Um, all right, so what I'm hoping to talk about today um, at, con conveniently, by, by, by sitting through the last talk, I, I got a sense of, of some of the things that um, Lisa was trying to cover with, with Python. Um, and so I'm, what I'm hoping to, to talk about is um, actually the same kinds of things, um, but with a little bit of a, a different approach. 
so um, when when working with digital humanities text analysis, um, you you can leap straight into Python, um, but often uh, that's that's a really big commitment as you as you just experienced. There's things to install. There's you know a programming language to learn. There's there's syntax that you have to get exactly right, otherwise it won't work. Um, you know there there are lots of different things that can go wrong. Um, sometimes what you want to do is um, even just explore your text a little bit, get some sense of like what kinds of things are even there. What are the questions that you want to be able to ask of this text um, before you commit to um, you know installing a bunch of software and writing a bunch of code and learning about the syntax and, and making it work. Um, so what what I'm hoping to to talk about today is um, Voyant Tools, which is a a sort of simple, friendly, fun web based interface for doing some of the very same things that you just saw with Python, um, but without having to to do the the coding and analysis yourself. Um, it's a great way to decide on kind of what kind of area of analysis you want to do. And then if you want to kind of pursue that with, with greater depth, um, you can do that with code um, or, or you can sort of continue with Voyant and, and, and other more straightforward ways. One of the nice things about Voyant as well is that, you know, up to a certain extent, it supports multilingual, um, you know, text analysis. So one of the things that you, you may quickly discover if you want to work with text in any language besides English is that um, a lot of the tools and, and code are really intended for people to be working with English or languages that work like English. Um, you know, there's an assumption that things are always spelled the same way. There is an assumption that words are separated by spaces. There's an assumption that, you know, words don't have a lot of different variant forms. Um, so, I mean, in English, we have, you know, singular and plural, you know, cat versus cats. We have, um, you know, past, you know, the, a past tense form. We have, um, you know, a, a the third person singular, you know, uh, I walk, but he or she, you know, I, I walk, but he or she walks. So these are, there's some variation in the word forms in English, but probably not nearly as much as as some other languages you can think of. Um, you know, French, for instance, you have a lot more verb conjugation. Um, you have masculine and feminine nouns. Um, and so then adjectives, um, you know, will change depending on whether they're modifying something that's singular or plural or masculine and feminine. Um, and all of these are, are a problem if you're trying to do something, uh, a method that is based fundamentally on word counts, as so many of them are. Word counts assume that um, your word is going to appear basically the same way everywhere, um, which is mostly okay um, as an assumption in English, but not so much for, for many other languages. Um, so Voyant can't fix that problem for you necessarily. Um, you may still need to do some pre-processing on your text um, to to kind of collapse the word forms and make it make your text look more like English. Um, but it does have stop word lists in multiple languages, and it does have um, the interface is available in multiple languages. Um, so what I'll what I'll show you today are a couple examples of how you can use Voyant tools, and I'll, I'll wrap up with some options for um, how to do some pre-processing on your text, so how you can modify your texts before you pass them off to Voyant um, to get even better results. And there's, there's some things you can do in Voyant too to kind of help collapse different variant word forms as long as it's not too complicated. Um, all right, so I will share my screen here. Um, okay, let's, let's move this over here. Um, all right, share screen. All right, and up. Oh, sorry, there we go. Sorry, there's some permissions, things I need to fix here really quick. And we'll get right over there. Oh no, I need to reboot my my uh, my browser. Um, so apologies, it looks like I will be right back um, with screen sharing. So um, if you could hold on just a minute, I will be right back here. Um, okay. Oh, all right, do we have, 
Does everyone see the screen here? Okay. I think is 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 the the screen sharing working for everyone? Yes, it's working. Yes. Okay, fabulous. Um, all right. So the the corpus that we'll be be working with here um, for for purposes of of this uh, kind of demo and experiment is um, we'll start with a set of a hundred articles. The first hundred articles published by Digital Humanities Quarterly, um, which is the the um, one of the the first open access journals of digital humanities. Um, mostly they, they publish articles in English. Sometimes they have um, kind of special editions or special articles um, in, in particular languages um, that had a special issue in Spanish and French and Portuguese. Um, and all of their uh, texts are available as um, TEI encoded XML documents on their GitHub repo. Um, so what, what I did here was um, I, I took all these XML documents and transformed them into plain text files. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of, of simple, simple coding that is probably not worth getting into the details of. Um, but what I can give you here um, is if we, um, here we are. So uh, tiny, tinyurl.com slash dhq 100 works will get you to uh, this screen here. Um, that I will pull up. Okay. Well, all right. It doesn't like when I do that. Sorry. Let me minimize this, and we will get back to DHQ. Um, all right. Here we are. Uh, Digital Humanities Quarterly. So I, I took I took the first hundred articles that were published in DHQ, and I loaded them into Voyant tools. Um, so you can get a sense of what that looks like. Um, this is this is the URL voyant-tools.org, um, and what you can do when you get here is you can choose some of their pre-existing corpora. Um, so you can choose um, Shakespeare's plays or Jane Austen's novels. Um, you know, kind of common public domain English texts. Um, or you can put in URLs for web pages um, here, and it will it will pull up all the text on those web pages. Um, or you can go to your own computer and uh, choose to upload multiple files. So I went here to my DHQ folder. Um, here we go. And you can just select multiple text files here and then choose open. Um, I've already added these to a corpus. Um, so you, you can also explore these without having to upload them yourself um, using, using this URL, uh, the tinyurl.com uh, slash DHQ uh, 100 works. Um, and that will take you uh, to this screen right here. So um, it's it's kind of a lot when you first encounter Voyant. Um, it, it's very bubbly and and friendly and colorful, um, and it contains lots of different things like all smushed together in the same place. And it, it takes a moment to to orient yourself within it. Um, here we have a, a word cloud um, automatically generated for you um, once you you upload your corpus, um, just like just like Lisa showed. Um, not surprisingly, in a journal of uh, digital humanities, the biggest words here are digital and humanities, um, and new and work and research, information, university, text, um, kind of all, all, all the sorts of um, you know words that are, are kind of the fundamentals of, of what we're talking about here. Um, if you look at the middle panel here, this is the the reader panel, so you can actually um, you know read through the text. Um, in this case, and, and see all the places that a word occurs. These different bars here um, indicate the different lengths of the different articles, and each each color kind of represents a different document in our corpus. Um, so this article one was quite short. This one over here, if we scroll over, um, you know, is is a good deal longer. Um, if you hover over any word here, uh, you can see what its frequency is in that document. 
Um, and, you know, depending on the document that you're looking at, um, that might give you some ideas of, of things to explore in, in, other, in other panels. Um, so this is, this is within like a single given document here. Um, over on the right hand side, um, we see again, very sort of like smushed together, although you can always resize things a bit. Um, we see all hundred of the, uh, the works that we've uploaded here along with the um, kind of changing frequencies of the most common words, you know, that being digital humanities, new text and, and work. Um, so crucially, these are, these are frequencies rather than counts, which is, which is a little bit harder to um, kind of grasp conceptually, um, you know, but part of it is that, you know, you have to have um, word frequencies when you're comparing against multiple documents versus counts, um, because um, a count, uh, is, is inherently tied to how long the document is in general. Um, so, you know, if you have like 20 occurrences of a word in the first document and 20 occurrences of the word in the second document, um, and one document is, you know, 200 words and one document is 2000 words, um, that, that word is, is much more frequent, um, you know, if it's 20 occurrences out of 200 words versus 20 occurrences over 2000 words. Um, so down in the, the bottom left panel here, um, we see a, a summary of the documents. It says, you know, there's 100 documents in the corpus, um, 718,000 total words, and 34, 308 unique word forms. Um, the unique word forms here is, um, again, something that, that gets messier um, as you deal with multiple languages because, um, you know, it, it doesn't pick up uh, variants of, of the words, you know, so it only, it, it, as it mentions here, it counts the word the as, you know, one word every time, um, but there's, it doesn't count the difference between, you know, book versus books. Those get treated as two different, uh, two different words. Um, the summary panel also has information about your documents, you know, what, what's the longest and the shortest, um, you know, which have the, the um, kind of the greatest diversity of vocabulary, how many words per sentence. Um, and then if you, if you scroll down, you can see um, just at a glance here, what are the distinctive words compared to the rest of the corpus? So what are, what are the words that are more frequent for any given document than all the other word or all the other documents in the corpus? So, you know, document one is talking about Willard McCarty. Um, you can get a sense the document four here, um, you know, has to do with Tibetan and, and you know, probably Buddhist texts. Um, number 10 is, is probably a game studies paper um, with player, PC, game um, as, as key words. Um, you know, over here we see icons, artifacts, artifacts, icons, and visual. Um, so the, the, looking at the, the distinctive words um, is is a good way to kind of get get a sense at a glance of of what some of these these documents are about, um, and then moving over here to the bottom right, um, you can see the the context of any given term. So in this case, the term is the the most frequent word in the corpus, digital, um, and you can see kind of what appears before and after it, um, you know, everywhere in the corpus. And there's there's three thousand two hundred twenty examples of it of it here. Um, so these are these are all a way um, when you're dealing with more texts than kind of you know what to do with or, or you could read with your own eyeballs um, to get a sense of like what are they about and you know what might they have in common or, or what makes them distinct. Um, now one of the the criticisms of Voyant tools versus um, you know a number of other approaches is the the things that it does um, behind the scenes like invisibly for you. Um, there, there are some things um, that you have to do more explicitly and kind of opt into um, with Python that you don't with Voyant. So for instance, um, you may notice in this word cloud here, all the words are lowercase. It, it automatically um, you know, lowercases every word for you. Um, this may or may not be what you want. Um, there, there are some languages where um, capitalization actually makes a semantic difference in the words. Um, so in, in that case, um, unfortunately, the lower casing step, I don't believe is something that can be modified unless you go into the Voyant source code. So if you're working with a language where um, you actually want to keep the capitalization, um, you, you may be out of luck here. Um, another thing that it does um, that, that, again, is something that, that Lisa referred to with, with the Python, 
um, is that it, there's a there's a um, a stop word list that goes on in the background here. So if you hover over this um, kind of toggle icon that appears at the top of every panel when you when you hover over there, this is your configuration options, and we can see here. Um, it's using the, it's auto detecting the language for the stop words. Um, and we, it, it's applying them globally. So the stop word list are the words that are, are super common um, that it basically filters out of the corpus. Things like, you know, the and 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 a in English. Um, those are things that it, it just like disappears. Otherwise, our, our word list, um, our word cloud over here would just be like the and a. Um, we, we can actually. Um, see that if we say none and hit confirm, um, we'll watch it. It should blow up here. Is it working? It's going to take a second to process because um, of how many documents there are. But yeah, this is what happens if we get rid of the stop word list. Um, all of a sudden, we don't see anything about digital humanities. All we see, oh, we, I guess we, we do see humanities and digital like down there as like tiny words, but it's all like of the and to in. Um, which is not useful at all for, for text analysis. Um, and similarly here, um, now it's giving us the most frequent word, um, which is now in, um, and we don't actually care how many times people use in in these documents. Um, as I guess as a side note, like we might care how much, how often people use in um, if we're looking at um, stylometry, which is a, a sort of way to try to detect authorship of texts um, based on the different ratios of high frequency words that people use. So it turns out when people write kind of unconsciously, um, they tend to have different frequencies of these, or different ratios, these super high frequency words. Some people use the more often, some people use of more often um, in ways that sort of can turn into a, a distinctive fingerprint in people's writing. So maybe this can be useful um, for an entirely different approach, but usually when we're doing text analysis, like we don't, we don't care about these small words, like we care about the content words. And for that, we need a stop word list. So let's go back to our stop word list and we will choose um, English here. And what we might want to do, this, this is always a good idea, um, is never trust any stop word list unless you've looked at it yourself. Um, sometimes stop word lists, especially for, for non-English languages, but honestly, sometimes for English too, um, are created for very specific purposes. And they may um, be throwing out words that you really like want to include and do care about. Um, so one, one of the, the examples that, that always comes to mind for me um, with Voyant stop word list is um, the, uh, the, the check word list um, includes the words um, for article. There was, it sounds like that, that word list for the Czech language was developed um, kind of in a journalism context where they wanted to get rid of all the references to article um, you know, like you know, publishing an article um, because that that would have like been noisy in their their corpus. Like they didn't care about the word article; like, they cared what the articles were about. An article was coming up a lot, so they got rid of it. Um, but when people like grab stop word lists that people have posted online for various languages, um, there's not always an explanation of the context in which uh, that stop word list was created. And so then, um, you know, kind of they just people pick it up um, and use it without without realizing what is or isn't included. So if we look, I don't know if I can make this bigger, not really. Um, but if you, you you do have the 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 DHQ 100 words works link, you can you can try this out yourself and take a look. Um, the stop word list for English is is pretty reasonable. Um, it includes things like where and when and well and via and very upon. Um, it has it has words um, that are numbers spelled out like twelve. Um, Clearly, this was developed um, with an eye towards the Shakespeare corpus that's built into Voyant, because we also have like thy and thee and other other older English words that we don't really use anymore. And would be kind of weird on a normal stop list or stop word list because yeah, I mean, it's not like if you're if you're analyzing you know tweets, you don't need to worry about like thy and thee um, all the time usually. Um, so things like otherwise, nevertheless, um, meanwhile, all of these are on the list. Um, you may choose to include them or not. You can you can edit this freely. Um, let's say we 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 want all of these years, for instance, we want those to appear in our corpus. We can take all these year entries and just uh, delete them from our stop word list and say save and confirm. And hopefully, if this works, all of these ends. There we are. We're back to digital humanities um, and things like that. 
Um, one thing I, I do see here that we might want to get rid of um, is this HTTP, uh, because in, in Digital Humanities Quarterly, there are a lot of links to things. Um, and this this is not this is a word that appears um, you know with a fairly high frequency, but isn't something that actually gives us a lot of information. Um, so I'll just add HTTP to our word list and save, and now it should reload and be gone. There we go. Um, so this th this is something that you you usually have to do iter iteratively. Um, as you um, kind of work through an environment like this and work through analyzing your text, um, sometimes you delete, you know, remove a word um, using the stop word list, um, and that surfaces something that you then need to get rid of as well. So now that we've gotten rid of HTTP, we see this GT here. Um, and if you, if I click on this here, let's see if I can find it. Um, if I search for GT, um, here, over, over here, it pulls up on the frequency. It shows us which articles um, have a lot of this going on here. And down here in the, the right-hand uh, panel, we see the context where it appears. Um, so looking at this, this is, this is actually some code um, that is there in the text. It's the, it's the greater than um, symbol uh, you know, used in math equations and also when writing brackets for code. Um, so this, again, isn't something that the GT and LT here um, are things that like aren't actually necessarily all that useful for our analysis if we're looking at the contents. It's a, it's a typographic convention. So once again, we might just go back to our stop word list and edit it and get rid of G oh, GT and LT, and we'll hit save. Confirm. And now, once it reloads, those are gone from our list. Um, so yeah, this this is this is always something where um, I think one one of the things that is not often emphasized enough about doing text analysis is that like there's there's not always a clear answer to any kind of question that you have. Um, it's not just that like you load the text in and then you can like, get some analysis um, out of it. Um, a lot of it depends on how you prepare the text and what you include and what you exclude. Um, so are you including um, things like this GT and LT that, that indicate code? Are you including, um, you know, maybe, you know, for purposes of like getting into what people were talking about, maybe we feel like actually the phrase digital humanities um, you know, is is a distraction that it's that these are words that are too large in our corpus that they're they're hiding um, some of the less frequent words that might actually be more interesting and insightful. Um, so we could choose to exclude those, and that would that would surface um, some of the less common words that might actually be carrying more more content. Um, you know, even even things get even more complicated when you start looking at other languages um, and, and you've got questions then of like, how did you prepare your text? Did you do anything to make, um, you know, to reduce the diversity of different word forms of the text? Um, so there's there's a lot of different um, decisions that you have to make when doing text analysis, um, even before you like run the analysis yourself. Um, text preparation is is really important. Um, you know, even even more so when you're dealing with like messy social media data. Uh, if you want to work with like tweets, for instance, you know, do you include um, you know the at sign and various usernames? Do you include URLs? Um, do you want to try to get the the geolocation of the tweets? Um, and there's no right or wrong answer to any of those questions. Um, it all just depends on on what you're trying to ask and how you're trying to to answer it. Um, and, and and with text preparation, um, you know, it, 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 in many cases, like there are many there are many right answers, um, and what you just need to do is like pick a convention and then write it down someplace, um, and be sure to like write down all the things that you're doing to your text. So if you decide that you're getting rid of, um, you know, the GTs and LTs that indicate code in your analysis, um, write that down someplace. And then when you're writing up your analysis, you know, it might be worth mentioning some of the things that you did to, to clean and prepare your data um, because that that actually can change the results of, of what you get. Um, all right, so ex I, I guess probably now is a good time to check in if people have questions so far, and then we can go explore um, a couple more of the tools here and then look at what happens with French.
Any questions so far? Thank you so much, Queen, for uh, the presentation. Uh, I, you, you are issuing question will come. I, I know. At least, of course, see the one that somebody has just made a presentation and you thank the person. The person, you don't need to bombard her with questions now. <laughs> I, I know, I know. No, she definitely, I know she did ask for it. But the manner of presenting, let's put our hands together for her. <laughs> We can, okay. I can, I can, I can show you some more things. I, I, I welcome questions, but we can also do more things, like more, more of the different tools, if you'd like. Um. Um. Okay. No, <laughs> you hold on. Okay, go ahead, please. Whatever thing you are going to show, but let them ask your questions. Maybe during your um, explanations and responses, you can bring in any other thing you want to show us. Okay. Sure. I have. I have how many questions? Okay, one, two, three, four. All uh, right. There are about four questions. Queen, will you take them as they come, or or you want them to 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 give all the questions, and then you can take them one. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to answer questions that that might lead us in other interesting directions. So yeah, let's bring on the questions. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good. No. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Queen. <clears throat> I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I'm Koso David uh, To from the University of Yaoundé, One Cameroon. Uh, please, how can we represent that data in a graph and transport it to our works if we are writing an article, for example? Yeah, that's okay. that's that's a great question. Um, okay, good. Good, you got it. Uh, uh, should I give the mic to the second person? Um, let me answer this one, and then and then I'll take the second one. Okay, that's um, good. That's good. Go ahead. Yeah. So there there are many different graphs that you can do here. Um, so here's here is the trends panel. Um, let's say uh, let's choose the word game. Um, we'll use the game with the asterisk. Um, asterisk is basically a wild card character for anything that comes afterwards. Um, so this includes game, game world, gamers, game space, uh, if you choose the one with the asterisk here. So let's let's look at this one. Um, so we can we can see here pretty clearly, you know, which um, kind of which uh, articles really relate to games. And let's let's choose the word uh, play to go along with it. Um, so you can see here also that there is oops, um, there are some articles that talk about play outside the context of games, or at least play is a much more prominent uh, term than than games, although the two often do go together. Um, so this is this is one of multiple uh, graphs that you can do. Um, there are others that we can choose as well. Um, kind of we can explore them by by hovering over um, these these different options up here. Um, but once once you're once you have a graph that you're happy with, let's say you want to use this one to show the the frequencies of game and play across the corpus, you can hit this export button, um, and you can get um, an HTML snippet for embedding this view in another web page. Um, you can get a bibliographic reference for this view if you want to point people to it online. Um, and another thing you can do, honestly, if you just want to take the image and use it for an article, um, you can take a screenshot. Um, that that really is the easiest way to get an image off of um, something like this. Just take a screenshot of the image, and you can embed it in your article. Um, you know, ideally, you know, you might want to include a citation that you can get from this from this export panel. Um, if you're putting it online, oh, here you go. You can also export a ping image. Um, for this one, I don't know. I was being fiddly earlier. You can also you can take a screenshot, or you can hit this export a ping image of this visualization, um, or you can you can also use a, a bibliographic citation for where you got that visualization from in your in your article. Um, I think that covers that one. Um, any any other questions? Yeah. Follow. Yeah. yeah, three more questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me. 
my name is yeah my name is Kenneth from the University of Ghana I'm Kenneth from the University of Ghana. Um, I think you mentioned that it's unable to, the system is unable to recognize variants of the same word. So I am asking, is there no way of um, putting an end or so if you are issuing the command, then you issue, um, let's say, A, N, flash, A or A or B, so mm -hmm. that um, you can pick or um, the variants, is that possible? Not exactly. Um, it, it, yeah, so I mean, with it, when it's something as, as, that would be nice if you could do something like that when it's when it's sort of a, you know, a word ending um, to be able to include it or not. The best option that you have built into the tool without doing anything specific to your corpus first um, is is this wild card? So um, if we do, um, oh, this is so R E A D for read. Um, there's read. If you choose the wild card, you get um, you get read and reads, um, but also ready and readily. So it like there's there's not kind of like a, a linguistically sensitive. Uh, variant thing so if we put you can choose multiple of them here so here's read and here's reads um which is tiny um but that's there's there's no way to be like i just want forms of you know read i don't want read and you know ready and readily um the way that you have to do that if you want to kind of uh, condense the amount of variation in your word forms is you have to do something um, called lemmatizing. Um, and lemmatizing is, is basically a, a process um, of converting all the words in your text to their dictionary form. So the result is a text that for the human reader is grammatically incorrect. The, the verbs are not conjugated. Um, you know, the, the nouns don't agree with the um, adjectives and things like that if your language does that. Um, but it's a form that the computer can read more easily because literally all it ever sees is the dictionary form of a word. So it's able to like count them all together. Um, and there are, unfortunately, there's no kind of like one click easy button to, to do that in Voyant or, or anything else. It's all language specific. And, um, you know, for, for larger um, global languages, you can find uh, lemmatizers. I can, I can um, send a link to um, a set of Jupyter notebooks that I've written for how you can do this in Python um, for English, uh, French, Spanish, German, uh, Russian. Uh, using using various Python packages, um, but not not all languages have a lemmatizer, and and for some languages it's hard because um, just the way the way that words are put together, there's no clear dictionary form. A word can be a combination of different things that bring together a more complex meaning. Um, so if you if you can't find a lemmatizer, you may search for stemming which is kind of like a cruder version of lemmatizing where um, it's an algorithm that, that cuts off the endings of words. Um, so what you get out of it may not be the dictionary form of a word, but it is um, at least a version that doesn't have the ending on it um, that hopefully is still recognizable um, and, and, it, and it may work better for doing word count things. Um, but yeah, once if you, if you want to do like, you know, this word, um, you know, with or without an ending, um, specifically, you probably need to do something to your text in advance to make that happen. Round of applause. Yes, we have two more questions to... Is it... It's... Okay, okay. Thanks so much. I am a Mecca from Veritas University, Abuja. The lecture on using um, Voyant for textual analysis, very wonderful. But my problem is now, how can an editor make use of this tool? And then, are there other tools an editor can use for, for editing the works? Thank you. That's, that's a good question. Um, could, you, could you tell me more? Like what, in, in, in what context are you, are, are, you, are you talking about like creating like a digital edition or? Like an editor, a journal editor, mm -hmm. is giving a work written to correct the sentences, the ideas. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, um, it's only for textual analysis. Can edi an editor use it for editing the works? Yeah, maybe. That, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought about it that way. Um, I mean, for for what it's worth, um, you know, the D Digital Humanities Quarterly has its own its own process for doing things. But I, I think this actually could have some value for a journal editor, um, you know, to sort of help think about uh, like how an article kind of fits into the the bigger picture of things. Um, you know, so so for instance. Um, if you had all of the other articles, maybe all the other articles in a, in a certain issue, or even all the articles, you know, from the past five years of the journal, um, available as plain text files. So you, you may need to sort of prepare those files. You, you, unfortunately, you can't upload PDFs um, or things like that because you have to be able to extract plain text from it. But if you if you have the text of um, a set of, of articles um, and, and you sort of add in the one that you're currently looking at, um, that could give you a sense, for instance, using the uh, like distinctive words down here um, to see how that article fits into um, kind of the other the other articles. What what are the the key words um, that it has, and and are those words that that other um, that other articles in the same issue have? Is are are you looking at this as a piece that provides a different perspective or one that blends in? Um, so with these distinctive words, one of the the fun things you can do here is you can you can click on one. Oh, too many open files. I'm sorry, Voyant. Um, in theory, I'll, I'll I'll reload this. Oh no, I've I've made it upset. Um, in theory, you can click on one of those words, um, and you'll see um, in the sort of uh, graph on the upper right hand corner um, where that word is frequent across the other the other works. So, for instance, with the the piece that you're looking at. Um, you can look at its distinctive words and see, um, you know, are there many other articles that have that word? Is is that the only article that's discussing this topic? And then maybe it's not a good fit. Um, so I think I think there's 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 things you can do there to to explore it. Um, also, not not that this is like the major concern or or should be for anyone, um, but there's if I if I go back over here, uh, oh no, it's it's working on it. Um, there's a, a a tool over here that's phrases. Um, and you can see what the longest phrase is that's repeated from um, another another document. Um, so these are all all in French. Um, but if if you have concerns about plagiarism, um, you know between the article that you're looking at and other things that you've published, um, you can easily go over to this phrases tab and see are there long stretches of text. Um, that appear somewhere else in your corpus. And sometimes that's totally fine. Sometimes people are citing the same thing, um, but it, it, it can be another another kind of tool to, to make use of. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for the, uh, for the answers. I'm sure that, um, okay, there, we can only take two more questions so that. Uh. Okay, good evening. I am Ninjo Jampur, University of Yaoundé One. But I want to ask my question concerning cases where we find datations, numbers, and so on. When we are now putting these texts in variant tools, we find a lot of numbers that we are not able now to analyze the text and to have a a certain ability of analyzing words because numbers are too much. What to do then when we are in this case? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so that uh, one of the things that, that I, I try to encourage students to do, um, you know, even even if they don't want to um, deal with digital humanities methods um, in the sense of like the numbers and the statistics and the frequencies, um, is is they can they can use Voyant. Um, kind of as a way to do like stealth DH. Um, they don't need to talk about like, you know, the numbers or the frequencies, but it can be a way to kind of like check your intuition about things. Um, so for instance, if your sense as a reader who has, you know, read this book with your own eyeballs, um, if your sense as a reader is that um, kind of there's more emphasis on, you know, nature in the first part and uh, domestic life in the second part, um, you know, what you can do is you can put the text, you, you can, you just upload the, the novel or, or just a single text into Voyant. Um, and then you can, you can check on that. You can look for, you know, words like, you know, trees and sun, 
um, you know, and, and you know, sky, um, and see kind of what the frequency is over time. Um, you don't have to worry about the numbers involved, but just check and see, like, are these words that indicate nature more frequent in the first half than in the second half? Um, and, and I mean, one of the challenges as a human reader is that sometimes like, you know, things in, in novels or across multiple novels um, really make an impression on you. Um, but if you look at the text itself, um, you know, the, like it doesn't necessarily always hold up. Like maybe there was a moment in the first half of the book where nature was really important, but it wasn't actually the first half of the book. There was just this one moment where that really stuck with you, um, where nature was discussed. Um, so using Voyant, you can actually you can actually check the assumptions that you're making and the claims that you're making, um, and you might choose to reframe the claim that you're making as a literary scholar based on what you see in Voyant, even without worrying about like the numbers of the frequencies. Maybe maybe what you say is you know there's an important moment you know like a third of the way through the book where nature you know is a predominant theme rather than saying the first half of the book is about nature after you see where the words are occurring. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my question is, is it possible to uh, analyze some phrases or series of sentences using variant or there are other tools you will recommend? For instance, I want to take the boy, the boy mm -hmm. is good, okay? Instead mm -hmm. of uh, the isolated words that we find in Voyant. Is it possible to do that through Voyant or we use other tools? Thank you. Yeah, so you, you, definitely, you definitely can. I think part of the, part of the question is um, what, your, what your corpus is. Um, I'll just, just choose 10 here to make this um, a little bit easier. Um, but if you if you have a corpus of text where you're interested in looking at that particular phrase, um, what you can do there's there's a couple things you can do here. Um, in the uh, context panel here, if we search for um, well we'll just search for computer here. There, I don't know how many boys there are in in, in DHQ, um, but you can you can see here you know it's a, a pretty quick and easy way to see how, how it's being used. If we say, um, oh, I wonder if we can do two things together, computer and uh, using. If we do using and computer, we can see if they're, they're, they tend to go together. Um, there's actually a, a correlations tab here um, that lets you see, you know, are, are two sets of words generally like going up and down at the same at the same rate? Um, if you want, yeah. So if you want to just sort of use your your eyeballs here, um, you can use um, the context tool to put in a word like boy and see, you know, what what words are occurring with it. You can also sort. Um, so if you wanted to see, you know, good boy, um, you can sort by what's immediately before computers, um, and then sort of group those things together. Um, another tool that that is commonly used that that may work easier for multi-word phrases um, is called AntConc. A N T C O N C. Um, it's software that you download. Um, that it, basically it's a giant concordance tool. Um, but that 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 one might be a little bit easier for dealing with phrases than um, the sort of jury rigging, like looking at individual words that you would with Voyant. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was actually looking for. Um, such phrases on uh, the Cyrus, the word cloud, whether we can have words uh, variant giving us the word cloud, not in the other context. Like oh, yeah. Um, so what you can do here with that um, is you can you can also change. Um, so the, the way the way that the word cloud works right, like sort of by default, is that it takes all the words minus some stop words um, that you've defined that it, it filters out. Um, or you can do something called a whitelist, um, where you, basically you define what words it sh that should be in. So we'll do, you know, game, uh, computer, game, uh, adventure, and we'll, we'll try boy and see if that, that does anything here. Um, and it will give you the relative frequencies of those. So in, in, in this particular corpus, game is huge, adventure is, is, is 
pretty big, computer is fairly small, and, and boy is non-existent. So you can you can set you can sort of decide what things you want to look at relative to each other by using the whitelist option on the word cloud. Okay, thank you. Please a round of applause for Quinn Dobrowski, Stanford University, United States of America. Thank you so much for uh, your, I, I, I'm sure that the, the participant enjoyed uh, the presentation. I'm sure, um, be ready to, uh, they would also would like to engage you more and more as a program. If there are questions that, that will definitely come after this, maybe as they sleep, some of the questions will come. I'm sure we have to export the questions to you to answer. Yeah, please get in touch. Okay, I will. Thank you so much. Please, a round of applause before she leaves us. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye. Right, bye. Yeah, bye. So, uh, we want to uh, actually, like, this is very important. It's a further uh, analysis of what you can do in test analysis. But, like I told you yesterday, you still need a lot of creativity to use Viant or Antcom or any other one, Satil. There are so many of them. You still need a lot of creativity. The reason is because just like you have the, the Cyrus and you have other elements and tools inside the tools you will use. But what matters actually is the interpretation given to them. This is, the, the, the manipulation is good. That is why distance reading needs people with close memory. You understand what I mean? Distance reading, it actually needs people with what? Close memory, not distance memory. <laughs> and so some of us belong to the school of thought in digital humanities, especially when it has to do with what they call color. Computer-assisted literary analysis, color. That's what I do. And so if you're going to do color, it means that you have to understand theoretical underpinnings you will use to interpret such things. That will be the privilege you have over others. Can you download some of your results? Yes, she had demonstrated how you, you just go to a drop, uh, you, you see a drop down and you click, you, you, you can download directly into your paper, assuming uh -huh. you can as well download into download of your computer. Later on, you can pick it up and just copy it. And so there are so many other means. Let me see the other question. Okay, is it possible? Yes, most of these softwares, you can use some offline. You can use some online. But remember too, like she, most of the speakers have told us, that you need to, you, you, you have to do a lot of conversion because most electronic copies of works are in PDF. And some of them might not necessarily accept PDF. And so you need to um, go to test file and then from there. So what you can do is, as you are building your, your corpus, you will create files that these files are on test file. These ones are on PDF. And so that at any point in time you want to do analysis, do you import and just copy and paste immediately and run it? And when you run it, you note down. Now, while I say so is that for you to interpret collocates and all those things, they are linguistics elements, but they need interpretation. For tomorrow's uh, uh, streams, we have, um, we're going to do, before you leave, or while after your meal, um, uh, one of our resource persons, he himself, I, I, we, he will be introduced properly, but he has been part and parcel of us. You will see him. He's, he's going to tell us what and what we should do so that by tomorrow, because it's a hand on, it's going to, some of us are in language documentation, endangered language. Mm, uh, and all those you want to, you, you need to come tomorrow and be very, very attentive. Uh -huh. Yes, Mose, please let them just in a few minutes tell them what and what they need to do. Please. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Richard. Um, 
I am uh, Dr. Moses Ekbenyong from University of Uyu. I've been working with um, linguists and um, uh, my PhD research was purely in computational linguistics. Um, I've also worked with the medical, um, in the medical field and I want to tell you that all the magic behind um, AI and Boyan's tool are nothing more than measures of central tendencies, mean, median, mood, but represented or visualized differently. So um, the approach I want to use is we've had enough of this for Western languages. But what we want to do tomorrow is to see how we can localize for indigenous languages. I started this with my PhD research, and we made some success. Um, when I um, uh, did a synthesizer for African tone languages. So what we are going to do is we want to start from the rudiments. How can you detach the language specific features from the algorithms, which is what is happening. So you take any algorithm like a black box, Boyan's to black box, you don't even know what goes on be behind it. So the Western languages has success in that, but they don't show you that. So what we'll do is we have, I have certain templates which you will from the beginning know how to modify this for your language. So you, so you just modify it and then run the tool. So um, the version one, the version one of that application, application does what we call syllabification. So you just put in the, your phoneme inventory, put in your syllabification rules in a file and then simply run. It does it for you in any language. Again, what I need you to do is that simply use your computer, record set of words, and have the text equivalent ready. What, I, uh, what that application also does is it simply does an automatic annotation. You don't need to annotate. You can annotate an hour of speech in... 30 seconds, provided you are done with the annotation, sorry, with the, you have a text equivalent of what you recorded. There is a back end that does that for you automatically for any language. So that is what we want to look at. I had this, um, this, um, uh, um, this drive from Professor Bambush, is it, are you, Bambush? Yes, Bambushe at Kwara State. When he told me that um, I am sitting on a gold mine because of research I, I presented, when I ran the synthesized voice, it was pretty equivalent as the um, original voice. And the one question he asked me, he said, well, you don't have the resources, which is what is, or the finance. But what I can tell you is, do not leave these things for them. My co-supervisor invited me and said, I will provide funding. Let's come and do this thing. And he said, I know those people. They will present it and use it. So one thing we need to do, I, I, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of creating a virtual laboratory so that Anyone that wants to come into the hub, I have some set of um, researchers in the University of Uyu that we can together develop this application in such a way that you, you know one way of developing is community contributions. You may have different contributions for, from different communities, from different languages. I may not know your language, but when one is to use this application, you will, you will discover certain 
um, certain defects uh, so that at the end, what I want to achieve at the end is that we build what we call a language model that is language um, that is generic for different languages. So you just pick the template, put in your language model, and then you have a machine learning algorithm at the back end 